So the stirring of a thousand bells. So this was a movie made by myself and published by Sublime Frequencies. Um, if you're familiar with Sublime Frequencies, they're a, a really cool record label uh, based out of Seattle. And what they basically do is uh, publish uh, different types of um, lesser known musics from around the world. And they do dig up a bunch of old uh, recordings and, and publish those as well, which is kind of interesting. So there, there's quite a variety of kind of esoteric um, and sort of different uh, material on there. And they, they did uh, basically music documentaries uh, for a few years. And this was the, the last one that they actually put out was this film. And the, 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 the documentaries are a little bit um, more art films uh, than traditional documentaries. So, so I'm very excited to be presenting these films and I, I don't want to say too much about them before we get started uh, because the intention is for somebody to watch these who actually has never been to Solo, who's never been to Indonesia and, and might not understand the culture at all. So um, I do that in a, in, for a very particular reason that we can sort of discuss after the movies. Um, but that's all I'll say about it now. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you for watching it. Um, and I'm glad everybody was here. Uh, it's been a long time since I really showed this to many people. Uh, the movie, I think it came out in about 20, 2014, the year I, I moved back to the U.S. After living in Indonesia, I was there for two years uh, living in Seoul. I was a Dharma Siswa student uh, at EC. Yeah, which, which offered me a lot of time to uh, explore uh, solo and different sorts of interesting things going on there, different musical things. And uh, I just do want, I want to say, first of all, that uh, Sakaten Festival for me is one of the, my favorite things in solo. It's an incredible event. And, it, and if you're traveling to Indonesia, I would, I would try to visit while Sakaten Festival is happening just because it's, it's a very unique event. Um, and then the, uh, the second video was, uh, was, was basically a troupe of musicians and dancers, uh, represented by, uh, the Mancuna Garden Palace. So they're, um, a group called Pakarti and it's a group of musicians from Indonesia and also, uh, foreigners who are mixed together playing and dancing uh, alongside each other, um, to, to learn. And Pahartono runs that group, and he's fantastic, um, incredibly nice man, and uh, exceptional dance drummer. I have a question. Sure, thanks, Jody. Um, in the in the second movie, was the music a complete playthrough of uh, the accompaniment to the dance? Even though we didn't we didn't see the dance in sync all the time, but I'm wondering if we just heard a complete performance of that incredible level of music. So that was... Um, or was that edited also? It was actually, um, the, yeah, the music and the dance, the, the recording from that uh, happened at exactly the same time. Um, when I was recording it at the very end, you notice that it sort of like fades out at the end because my camera actually ran out of batteries. So I, uh, I lost the little tail end of there, but uh, that was all recorded at the same time. So we are hearing the music without any cuts. Uh, there, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I, mean, just, I don't believe I cut any of it. Interesting juxtaposition to have the the sweep, the trajectory of the music without a break mm -hmm. against the visuals. You know, that obviously had a lot of different things, and I love the shot of the musicians leaving before the music was over. That was really nice seeing them all walk out. Yeah. I, yeah, the uh, it was actually sort of a um, it was just a, a stroke of luck to have such a good shot because when I was recording that I was actually I was actually singing on that track also I was part of the performance group. Oh dear! Uh, yeah, <laughs> you can't hear me very well, but um, yeah, I just wanted to record it for personal use, and I asked Pahartono if I could record, so I just I just stuck my camera down. Right, basically right in front of where I was sitting and, and started recording it. And, it. and it came up with this very unique, interesting sort of angle um, 
And when I, when I went to uh, put this film together, I had basically a lot of footage from sort of traveling around Java and I didn't know what to do with it. So I, I sort of wanted to make sort of like a best of hits of my own personal memories of and traveling Dr. around Marston, Java. Yeah. Dr. Oh. Marston had a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, I like the uh, uh, Primoro in fast speed uh, accompanying the uh, motorcycle in get photos. <laughs> but my question is, uh, I think I would like to know more about how you uh, mix and match uh, different videos. Uh. What I noticed was that when we hear the scapen, but and then you s s saw a little bit of the real scapen performance, the sound and the picture is not matching. Correct. Is it on purpose or, 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 or there's the way how the film is supposed to be? In, in the way I, I can think of describing it as the, uh, uh, the sound of gamelan scatens accompanying the mute performance of gamelan scatens. <laughs> yes, uh, you would be accurate there because so when I, uh, when I recorded the audio and when I did the filming were two separate days. Um, I went on one day just with an audio recorder and recorded, I think around, I don't know, maybe eight hours of Sakaten music. And Bromoro was one of my favorite pieces that they performed that day. It's just an incredible piece. It's, it, and it was a very good length of, of time for this movie. Um, but I didn't bring my, um, my film camera. And I also wanted to get a lot of different angles and a lot of different shots. And unfortunately, if I were to do the same movie that I wanted to do um, and have it sync up with the film, I would have had to have a probably a film crew of around like four or five different cameras all recording at the same time. And I just had my one camera. So unfortunately, I, I basically had to take some shots stop shooting, move locations, shoot it a di you know, take some more shots. So I was always moving around. Um, so the, the video didn't ever line up with the, with, the, uh, with the music. So what I had to do is sort of think of a way to, to if, if I could match it in any way, and it doesn't really match at all, but I think what it sort of does with it not matching, if you can, if you can make it, uh, unless it bothers you, but if, if it, it sort of can put you in almost like a dreamlike state, I think when you're watching it yeah. Yeah. and sort of let the music kind of just happen and the visuals happen. And, and, and it's sort of, uh, it's sort of just a different perceptual thing. That's sort of how I take it. Yeah. yeah I think that seems to me the same, uh, things that you do with, uh, the, uh, Munsa is not always matching. Right, and and I I, I think the uh, this uh, Munsar, uh, this uh, the dance Munsar is really uh, has a complex uh, story and history to it, and uh, it, it's uh, it will be interesting to add uh, information about it. It's it's a uh, one thing that uh, missing from your in, from the introduction of that piece is that it's actually more than two elements, not on the uh, Ataningra, Ataningra is a, a Chinese princess, prince, uh, princess, and Kelasworo is a Japanese princess, and uh, um, Akung Mena is of course the uncle of Prophet Muhammad. So uh, in a way, uh, Srimpi Munsar is, uh, is uh, the way how Yosotipuro on the first from 18th century to see Java in a globalized world. We have uh, uh, Islam, Chinese, Javanese, Paranake is supposed to be a branch of France, and there's a Piola mentioned in that story as well. So it's an it's a interesting uh, there's an interesting background in that uh, 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 Serimpi Munsar. Yeah, 
I, I totally agree with you. Um, beside it being just an absolutely beautiful piece, it's super interesting um, from a, uh, oops, let me just put it on speaker view because so I can get who is speaking next. It's, an, it's, it's just an incredibly beautiful piece of music and, and, and I knew that the story was, in, was very deep and interesting and, and I actually started researching the story of that one after I'd moved back um, to the United States. And I had some I had some help trying to sort of uh, tell you know tell me what the uh, the story was and what the translation was, and I had some help from Mas Adi, who is one of the uh, sort of the amateur dancers at Mankunagar and who's at the Pakarti group, and and he was he was going to um, different people at Mankunagar and trying to help me understand what what the story was about, and I would love to have I never got a full translation of the story though, I, I couldn't get that. Um, I would love to have, to include that information actually, a little bit more of a complete information uh, on, this, on the story because it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, because what, from what I understand, the composer was sort of like, um, it was sort of more of a modern era composition and he was sort of, yeah, looking out and seeing how, how Job was interacting with all these different cultures in this, in this sort of back then it was a very globalized world for Indonesia, actually. Yeah, if anybody else has any information about that story and they'd like to share it with me at, at any point, I'd, I'd love to, uh, to hear it. And, and uh, there, there, is, there is a book uh, uh, containing, five, there's a five volumes book on the story of uh, of this uh, uh, attending in Kalasboro. And this is actually the work of literary works from 18th century by Yosso Tipuro the first. And uh, there's a, I think it was five volumes of that story from that book. That's a lot of story. That's very cool. From, and from what I understand as well, um, right around that time period, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the Book of Manak was um, very popular to take stories from, um, for Wayang, for dance, and for other things. And that's sort of a, um, the Book of Manak is uh, more of like an Islamic text. Like it, it came to Indonesia from uh, Saudi Arabia. And it's uh, sort of like a separate volume after the Quran is like one of, one of the important documents of early, of early Islam, which is very interesting. Uh, and, and, and from what I understand also, it's, it's a little less popular now than it was back when they were um, composing these pieces. Well, I had a question. Um, so regarding the uh, first part, uh, and you know, you as a filmmaker, at least in this context, I think it was rather refreshing to see a couple of uh, points where the people around you, so, you know, um, when you see a documentary, at least sort of like a professional level documentary, you're always sort of seeing the, uh, the images from a rather removed sort of perspective. But I think, uh, at, let's see, at time mark uh, 3150, so 31 minutes, uh, 50 seconds. So one of the musicians actually uh, sticks out his thumb in approval. And uh, the other one was uh, 32 minutes and 10 seconds where uh, I, so correct me if I'm wrong, Pat uh, Marsam, but I heard some people say, oh, Londo, Londo, you yep. know, hey, there's this white guy here. Yep. <laughs> and, um, I, I think it's really important, you know, so like Sakatin, it's not only like uh, the, the music, son, uh, you know, uh, atmosphere uh, that you get, but it's, it's this whole like week of festivity uh, with both music and uh, other sorts of entertainment, other, other sorts of diversions. And it, it, it sort of uh, coalesces into, uh, sort of like this uh, rame uh, atmosphere, which I believe is quite uh, essential, you know, in this part of the world. Um, and uh, I'm just sort of wondering uh, for the Sakaten audio, 
when you recorded, um, I sort of noticed that there was a lack of people sort of muttering uh, or talking, you know, in the background. So I'm just wondering if you if if you altered like the levels at some point, or whether uh, it was just the music and you really could not hear anyone talking, because that to me sort of struck me as, oh, that was sort of odd, uh, just because in many other contexts, like you would have smattering, uh, a smattering of people just talking yeah, in the background. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I just want to say, Ed, those are some very good observations. Um, on, the fir on the first point, uh, you don't really, I mean, in the video, there's not like a map, right? So we can't really see where these things are located. But uh, basically, the, the Kraton, if you, if you are unfamiliar with Solo, is, um, is a big palace that is um, sort of in the middle of the city. And around it, uh, on the north side and the south side, are the, these two very, very large grassy areas. It's called Alun Alun. Right. Several football field size grassy areas. And, there, and, and basically this, uh, this night market pops up out of nowhere on this giant grassy area right in front of the palace. Now, right off of the southwest corner of the Alun Alun is the, uh, the Grand Mosque of, of the city of Surakarta. So basically there's a little archway. And then if you walk through that archway, you have two small pendopo, uh, one on the north side of the complex, one on the south side of the complex. And those each house a different gamelan sakatan. And it's basically right next to this gigantic carnival that's happening right on the other side of the wall. And there's a lot of people flowing from one area to the other area. And they're sort of equally important in, in terms of the experience for people that are going to uh, visit the night market. So one thing about the um, atmosphere is that they just mix. They mix and meld with each other. And it, it's a very uh, exhilarating experience to, to go from one side to the other and to sort of be bombarded by all the, the audio uh, and uh, the oral sort of cacophony on one side, and then you have on the other side a little bit more of the sakatan, which is, you know, in, in some ways a very calm experience that gets tremendously loud and exciting also. Um, and then the second point about the people talking. So the, uh, when I was recording Bermoro, it was actually quite late at night. So okay. it was... It was one of the later performances, and by that point, um, there weren't too many people around. Yeah, usually during the daytime, and actually Pat Marsam's film uh, that he is doing the, uh, uh, on Sunday, he's, he's going to be talking a little bit about this stuff in more detail. In his film, we see a little bit more of the daytime atmosphere um, in the Sakatan Festival, whereas the one that I made here is basically the nighttime part of the festival. So a lot more people kind of around the, the instrument area in the daytime. And then at nighttime, it sort of disperses and people kind of go a little bit more towards the, um, the Alun Alun uh, night market uh, area. So there are a few, fewer people watching uh, the Sakatan at nighttime, but I believe the musicians, they, they, they're incredible. You know, they play, I don't know how many hours, it's almost 12 hours a day, perhaps. Um, it's a very long time. They start in the morning and they go all the way till, till late at nighttime. And, and the last piece they play is as exciting and, um, and inspiring as the first piece they play in the day. And even though their energy levels have to be very low because they've been playing all day, it's, it's incredible. And, and I would say even sometimes the pieces later on at night are even more intense um, mm -hmm. than the ones that happen during the daytime. Uh, so, and, and also something that you don't quite get an idea of uh, in terms of a map is actually there's actually two different uh, Gamma and Sakatan set up. So one of them plays on, sorry, I can't really show you. One of them plays here and then they take a break and then the other one plays on the other side. So the footage in the film is showing actually both sides. They're showing the, uh, the one side, which is led by Patsaptono, uh, who is the leader of the, the Kraton musicians. And then the other side, is, uh, is a different group of musicians and they sort of go back and forth with each other the entire time. And they, they have actually sort of different characters, the, both of these sides of the Sakatan. Mm. 
I think when we're making films like this, there's a couple of things now that we know we want to think about. One that kind of match things that are happening in ethnomusicology. One is how do you deal with the fact that you are present, right? Yeah. We're, we're, we're kind of past where we're trying to pretend that we're not there. Most things you read now begin with people talking about their own experience. Um, so when you're making a film, how do you deal with that? Yeah. With admitting that, that you're there. Thanks. And the, the other issue is, um, repatriation, I guess it's called formally, but returning back to the people who were there to help you make the film, to be in it, what do we owe them? I mean, do you show, did you show this in Java? Or do you have everybody's name? I mean, I mean, these are things that come up when you, that are difficult when you're in a public situation like that. But I think ethically, we still want to think about it. So I just, I mean, I know, if, those are two things that are on my mind a lot when I'm doing video. Yeah, those are, those are great uh, points. And they're, they're very important um, to talk about because I, I'm not an academic personally, um, but, I, but I, I think about this stuff quite often. And, and one of the things I, I thought about when making, especially the Sakatin movie, more so than the, than the second movie, has to do with your first point. Um, and that's, that's the, the point about, you know, sort of like how to, what, you know, where, where's the, where's the person with the camera, you know, in, in, in all this. And in my, in my, my idea for this film was to put the viewer, you know, of this and the, the, the point of view here is somebody who has been to, or is going to Sakatan for the first time is a foreigner, has no idea what they are seeing has no idea what the language means and is and is basically just wandering around trying to understand what what it is that they're looking at uh i i found a lot some documentaries um you know the more information you give potentially the 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 fewer you, the, the the further you get from the actual experience of this place so my my sort of idea was to, I love this festival so much. It was really one of my highlights uh, going, going there. I went there twice, two years in a row. And I sort of just wanted people to experience the festival the way that I, that I did. And that's as somebody that's relatively inexperienced, um, you know, in terms of time living in Java, not from the culture. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I believe that you know, the full acknowledgement of that is, is definitely the way to go in, in a film like this. And, and I'm actually working on a, on a subsequent film that is actually a feature length a film that's sort of in the same style. It's a not, not a gamelan, but it does, uh, was all filmed in Indonesia. So th those are definitely awesome points. Um, yeah, like, like there's no reason in my opinion, when making a movie sort of like this to, uh, especially when you want when you want it to be an experiential film to not put yourself uh, center uh, in there. And I hope people I hope people got sort of the feeling of that, the, the sort of the, the feeling of beauty, the feel, feeling of chaos, the feeling of not understanding um, sort of the, you know, how many title cards should I put in, in the beginning of the film to explain what it is people are seeing? Because, you know, there's there's the things you can point to in almost every single you know, every single shot of the film, like, what's that, what's that, what's that? And there's so many, there's like a story for almost every single uh, shot in the film. But, you know, if, if we were to do that, it would take you out of the experience of, of, of being there, which is sort of what my intention was. Um, I also have sort of a, uh, an interesting, sort of it goes along with that, like uh, an interesting thing about travel that, that I'm sort of grappling with, like, when should we travel, you know? Should we, should we try to travel or should we try to experience in, in more experiential ways that don't actually include traveling um, because of uh, environmental reasons? So that's another issue. And then the second one that Jody brought up was about, um, uh, I believe the word you said was repatriation. Is that correct? That might be the technical term of sort of like the acknowledgement of, of, the, of the people who are in your films and, and whatnot. So in the second one in Munchar, I, def I listed all the the dancers who were who were there, and, and 
they're they're all friends of mine actually and they all agreed to be in the film and everything like that um and uh you know and in uh the first film for uh the Sakaten film i had the permission of course of pasaptono and many of the other musicians um who are there uh i have several teachers who are playing music on the on the on the northern uh Sakaten uh, Pandopo, so they they were very happy to be for for me to be there. I unfortunately didn't get the names of every single uh, musician when I was there, and when I was making the film and originally publishing it, um, I had trouble securing the names of all the musicians. And if if I can find or if I can if somebody can help me identify all the, the names of the musicians, um, I would I would love that actually, so I could put it in there. Uh, and then the second thing was actually the, these movies were shown in Indonesia. So I, I held a, a, a held some screenings in Surakarta um, at UNS uh, University, which is right next to EC. So we showed the films there, um, and it was a very interesting um, reaction. Very different, you know, sort of an opposite reaction. So some people. Uh, the reaction was, why did you film this? This is just like normal life, you know, like this is just like, you know, it's, it's almost like to some people, it'd be like going to a county fair and filming it, you know? Uh, so it's, it was very interesting. I showed another film there that sort of has this uh, similar tone that I filmed in Chicago and people at the film screening in, in Indonesia were, were much more ex excited and interested to talk about that one than, than the Scott Ten film. Um, all right, I have a couple questions here. Steve, uh, Steve has a question first. Steve, you want to jump in? Here? Yeah. Hey, man. Hey. Also, hello to Pat Marsam and Pael and and uh, Mark. I haven't seen in a long time either. Um, but Matt, I I mentioned you. I think in an email a couple weeks ago, I, I said how much I enjoyed watching the Sakatan video, um, and it really recalls my own memories, like almost visually. The, the visual memories that I have of, of when I went to Sakata in, in Solo, um, you know, 20 years ago. Um, this time watching, I actually felt like I couldn't remember which were my own memories and which ones had come from watching your movie the last time. Um, but the question that I wanted to ask was, uh, what kinds of responses have you had from people who um, watched the movie who, who didn't have any 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 kind of preconceived idea of what Sakatan was or what music in Indonesia was like. Um, did you feel that it was like what you imagined when you were when you were creating it? Or did you feel like it got the message across that you wanted to or any of the I suppose I mean I'm sure you didn't have a singular message, but did you feel like you were you know kind of successfully communicated something to them? Yeah, thanks Steve. Um and I appreciate it. And I actually, I'm meaning to respond to your email and I'll respond oh, yeah. to you very soon. Um, <laughs> but I have uh, to follow up to I will wait eventually. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think when I show this movie, I, I did a, a, an East Coast tour of the film when I first uh, released it. We went to New York and we went to Philly and Washington, D.C. and showed it all over the place. It was really cool. And we got a lot of, uh, different reactions from people in the, in those places. And I think a lot of people really genuinely enjoyed the film, uh, and genuinely enjoyed the music and were sort of just like, in some ways flummoxed by the, like, I guess the juxtaposition of these different things happening at the same time. Um, but then in other ways, People were like, oh, yeah, that's very similar to some, you know, kind of fairs and festivals that happen in the United States in, in some ways, like similar things that, you know, similar conceptual mm -hmm. things that just look different. You know, people like the games and the, um, you know, there's there's some familiarity with a lot of this stuff. But then there's like enough that's different about everything that it's that it, that it makes you wonder about what, what it is you're looking at. So I think people really enjoy it. Um, at least that's what they tell me. Nobody's told me they've hated it so far. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone would hate it. <laughs> Maybe, I'm sure some people don't like it, but um, so far I've had very positive uh, reaction from it. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I, hope, I, hope it, I hope people have an emotional 
uh, reaction to the film as well as uh, you know a musical and a cultural reaction to it because uh, that's sort of the intention that that I put towards it. Yeah, well, thanks for thanks for sharing it tonight. Absolutely, thanks for watching again. Um, I have a I have a question. Um, something here from Otto here uh, for general information. Click participants in the bottom. Uh, As that was just for the raise hand. Oh, the raise hand thing. And you have a question. And I have a question. All right. Uh, First, I would just like. I'm going to try to pull up your yeah. view here because it's not. If I move around and talk, it'll trigger it to come up. No? Auto? Auto saying is. All right. Well, I'll just start talking. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so first off, I just wanted to tell you, I was really good footage. Uh, I actually invited my brother to this call because he came to visit me when I was doing my field work last year and I took him to Joja. And so he was watching this and he was like, Hey, is this like near there? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Good eye. Good eye. But then at the end of the film, I, I regretfully have to tell you, he asked what's, what's got the, he was like, what is it? So I'm somebody who doesn't really know that's kind of like the initial impressions. Um, but there's plenty of things to do. Um, I, my question is, and I'm kind of forgetting your introduction a little bit now, but I wanted, I guess, to talk, ask about the process of working with sublime frequencies and how that process went, because I guess they have very much kind of a crate digger aesthetic with a lot of the stuff that they do. Um, and so this film kind of came across to me as almost more information than a lot of the, a lot of their releases. Um, just in the fact that it's really contextualized. I don't know if everyone knows like their Radio Java and Radio Sumatra releases. They're quite literally uh, just recording radio broadcasts. They did, they, somebody was there and then releasing them on CDs. So there's no artists listed. There's no, I mean, or their information is very loose um, and a lot of copyright issues um, and kind of what Jody was talking about with like repatriation and giving it back and how, how does that work? Um, so I guess in that regard, how, how do you think about it? Um, just because it's very much part of global hipster cosmopolitan culture. And then kind of as Jody has been saying, it's like, what does that do for the people on the ground um, and that we're working with and how that goes? Because I mean, you obviously have a very deep connection. Uh, so yeah, I was just kind of wondering how you thought about that in the process and and yeah i think that's maybe sometimes what can kind of explain a little bit of your juxtaposition it just has that crate digger like now look at this now look at this and like just keep you know yeah so if you just want to kind of elaborate on that yeah thanks Otto. um yeah you're yeah you have a very good uh impression of of almost most of sublime frequencies work although they do have quite a variety of stuff out there um now um so working with them, they're, they're mostly a music label. So they put out CDs and they put out LPs and, and, the, and the stuff they put out is from all over the world. And, and there, have, there has been, you know, at certain times, I think some, some uh, you know, negative feedback towards the label over some of these issues, you know, because a lot of times they didn't know, you know, what they were necessarily even uh, putting out there, you know, so, um, but you know, I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves. Um, but you know, for me working with them, uh, basically I was, I made this a Gaten movie before, uh, I had any idea it was going to be a, a sublime frequencies, um, uh, release. It was just something that I, that I did for myself. And, um, I sent it in, uh, to them and I actually have, uh, some connections with some people that are friends with them in, in Seattle. So, uh, they saw the film and they loved it, you know, so they really liked it. And, and then they actually came to me and said they wanted to release it and, but it was too short. So I had to come up with another, uh, another film basically. And so that's when I put together the second part, the, the Muncher part. Um, and it, that turned out much, much better than I ever anticipated considering it wasn't something I had actually planned on making it, excuse me, when I was in Indonesia. Um, so you know, they didn't, they didn't, uh, they basically didn't tell me, you know, how to do anything. They just, they just really liked what I had already done. And they just said they wanted to release it. Um, yeah. And then just make it longer. Just yeah. Like, how they want to release it. 
Exactly. So yeah, it had to be about an hour long for, you know, for a DVD to actually, you know, for it to be worth putting out there. And, and I'm really happy they had that um, because, you know, it was it, it, that second movie, I think is for me a very powerful as well. So, um, but yeah, there's sort of like that fine line uh, between what I think is like an aesthetic experience um, that I'm trying to uh, showcase and sort of the, the, the issues that you can run into, um, you know, when, when you're, you know, you don't want to take advantage of other, of other people for your own benefit, you know, uh, you know, whether it's artistic, uh, benefit, um, you know, street cred benefit or anything like that. So, uh, I take that very seriously. Um, and I try to, uh, you know, I tried to put as much information in there and, and, you know, as I could to sort of acknowledge the sources, um, and, uh, also get permission, you know, to, to, to make the films at all. So that's very important. Um, yeah, I, uh, so yeah, I, I think I did my best. I probably could have done better. This is, you know, the first time I ever did a movie like this before. I mean, I, I, I do, I really do like the aesthetic feel though. I think you do get the, I, I congratulate. That's really well done. I mean, for a lot of documentaries I've seen, I do a lot of that. I, I am a PhD at UCLA and I, I show a documentary like this and yeah, a lot of times the feeling is not, um, doesn't come across. Mm -hmm. So. Thanks Otto. Um, I got another question here. Let's see here. Uh, Sutrezno Hartono. Uh, do you want to jump in Sutrezno? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Good evening, Matt, and everyone. Hello, hello. Hello, can you hear my voice okay? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your beautiful work. Uh, congratulations again for sharing this uh, cultural situations back in Java that uh, historically is very, very important, especially for Japanese people in the past. And even right now, I can still remember exactly how important this cotton is to my life that uh, inspired me to the cultural and also uh, social and many different contexts in this regard. I have a question for you, especially related to your movie. Uh, do you know of a historical context of cotton? If no, perhaps my suggestions, uh, you can add more, more, point or subtitle under the points where it is important to be shared with everyone. That's one. The secondly, uh, do you think there is or there are any political context in addition to cultural context in relation to the Pasar Malam during the movie that you presented here? I saw that uh, you also uh, put the pictures of how the king provide the offering where other people in general can take some stuff from there even on that difficult situations they have to grab anything that it, that they can take it for their their purpose i don't know what it's for and then from that point of movie i was wondering what is your opinion to look at that situations, perhaps I would like to hear from uh, from Western perspective how people look at that Javanese people grabs or maybe fight each other just to pick up the small thing from that uh, gift provided by their king. Uh, maybe if you or someone else would like to share on your own perspective to look at that situations, that would be key, uh, would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, man. Again, congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, those are uh, great points. Um, personally, I'm 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 somewhat familiar with um, the history of Sakatin, but I'm not. I, there are more people in the world that are more familiar uh, with it than I am. Um, and uh, Pat Marsum is actually going to be talking about a, a lot of that history um, on Sunday and sort of the the history of Gamelan, actually. So. If you enjoy this sort of different style of gamelan, if you want to learn more about the history of gamelan, Sunday is great 
uh, it's going to be a great lecture from Pat Marsum. Um, but uh, just to give a general idea, so the Sakatan is is uh, in some ways what what some scholars would call archaic, right? It's very old. It's one of the older types of of gamelan that exist, and the instruments themselves are also very very old. Um, you know, so some of them are from the uh, the 1700s even. You know that you know the 18th century. So they're very old, and they're they're heirlooms of the Kraton Palace, and they've been played for a long time. and And the original purpose uh, of them, you know, as is told, is that they were invented uh, by the Damak Kingdom uh, to basically be uh, a way to introduce Islam uh, to different parts of Java um, and sort of bring people to the mosque. Um, to get them interested in, in Islam. So that's, you know, the extra large size instruments and the extra loud uh, style is sort of like uh, something to be, uh, you know, to make people interested to come and check out what's happening. And also this festival happens around the, the, uh, the time of the uh, uh, Muhammad's birthday, um, which is a very important um, holiday. And uh, it's been going on quite like this for several hundred years, I believe. Um, I don't remember the exact year that um, these were these sorts of uh, performances were said to have started, but it's several hundred years, um, you know, at least maybe 300 years or so, uh, maybe even more. So uh, it's been a long time. I'm not sure. And another thing I'm not sure about is how Sakatin has changed over that, that amount of time. Like, I'm not sure um, what it looked like originally versus what it is, what it is like today. Uh, I'd be super interested in that kind of information. But there are also other, t there are other forms of what you would call archaic gamelan, which, which are just gamelan you don't see performed very often recently. Uh, there's one called Charabalan, um, which has basically these large canong sized pots and they're played in, in succession. And the songs are a little bit more simple, but they're, they're really cool pieces. And, and I love the music um, from these old style gamelan. It's, it's incredible. And, and a little bit different than modern gamelan styles. Um, and the, uh, sorry, the uh, second point, the political context of that. So from what I understand, the, um, you know, the, the Sultan has blessed all of the food. The Sultan is sort of seen as a religious figure and, and as well as a political figure in the past um, in Solo. So he's sort of, given his blessing over all this food that is being processed towards the mosque. And then people want to take some of it, uh, you know, for blessings or for good luck for the future so that they can have a, a, a good year, you know, and, and it's the atmosphere is, I would say the atmosphere is, is interesting because it's very crowded. I've never been in a place with so many people packed into one place. It, it felt dangerously crowded. I would say for, for my liking, um, but it was, uh, you know, I actually had my wallet stolen there. Uh, somebody, oh my gosh. somebody, somebody stole it from my, uh, I, I had a little fanny pack and somebody stole my wallet. I had just got in my, my monthly wage that they give you. If you're a Dharma CISO student, I went to the, the school. I got my monthly salary, uh, went to Sakatan and somebody stole it right from me. It's like $200 or something like that, which is like, uh, you know, all I had for a month. So I basically didn't have any money for the next month, but, and several people got arrested while I was there. Like there's a police station inside that area, right? Basically right next to the mosque. And there were uh, people being arrested. I'm not sure what they were being arrested for at the time, if it was pickpocketing or, or fighting or something, I don't know. So yeah, but there was a, a lot of commotion, but most people are having a really good time. Um, and sort of there to see the spectacle and, and also be a participant in the spectacle. And some people believe in, you know, what, what they're receiving when they, when they get something, I'm sure from the, uh, from the Gunungan and, and some people probably are, are there more for the atmosphere and for the tradition of, of what it is. I, I don't have any, I don't have any opinion on, on, on the political situation there personally, because it's not really as, as, is a person going there and watching it's not my it's not my place to have an opinion i don't think on on what's what's happening there just just to experience it
Um, and then I have another question here from Jody. If, if Jody, you want to jump in. Oh, you're muted, Jody. I was just wondering if you were going to make a film like this again, what you might think of doing differently. Yeah. Or, or if you have in mind another film project that you would like to do, kind of where, where are your thoughts about this kind of work um, evolving? Where are they going? Yeah. Well, yeah, so I mean, this, this movie was made on a budget of zero dollars, <laughs> which was, uh, you know, I already owned the camera. Um, I brought it to Indonesia and, I, and uh, the editing software, I think that I, I used to edit it, I think I pirated, you know, off of the internet. So it was, it was really a zero dollar uh, production, except for my own time. So, you know, making a movie, if somebody were to say, hey, you wanna make a movie, you know, about, about something, I'd say, that'd be great. Let's make a budget. And with a budget, you can do a few different things that are, aren't possible, you know. You can get better audio recordings. You can get better documentation. You can have assistance or, you know, around collecting personal information from people um, that, are, that are around. So uh, I would just say maybe some higher quality camera gear, you know, using that sort of, you know, better stuff would be great. Um, although I sort of like the aesthetic of it being a little bit on the, the lo-fi side in terms of what people are producing these days. Um, yeah, I, I think what I would do differently, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it, it'd be having better equipment um, and, and also having a better launch. You know, doing it with Sublime Frequencies was great because, you know, I was, no, you know, a nobody filmmaker before. I just made some personal films and, and I put it out with them because of some connections and, and the fact that they like the movie. But, you know, as far as movies go, it was, you know, probably it's not the best platform to put out a movie even like this because it's, it's really a music label and the, the audience is a little bit limited. So, and, and I didn't really know anything about music or uh, movie fests at the time. So I, I, you know, I put together a, a screening tour on my own and just sort of traveled around to different like art art houses around the East Coast showing the film. It'd be really great to have a little bit more of an organized, you know, situation with that. I think that would be wonderful. And and I I actually am making another movie currently. It's it's called um uh Brengenging Solo. So it's uh it's a feature length film. It's over two hours long and it's basically taking place at six or seven different uh uh, traditional markets in solo. It's not a gamelan movie. Um, there's almost no gamelan in the film. Um, there's a little bit, but not much. And it's sort of showing uh, just traditional markets in solo and and what to how how those are sort of experienced. Does um does that movie have a narrator or a narrative in some way? Not at all. It's just. That's something I've sort of uh, struggled with. Um, so the, the original con conception for the new film, and I actually filmed it um, when I lived in Solo. So I filmed it several years ago, um, but it's just been a long time coming out because it, it was actually a collaboration with, um, with another person who uh, lived in Solo when I was there. His name is Matt Shoemaker, and he's uh, an experimental uh, noise artist and a painter. Um, and he, he does sort of more ambient uh, soundscapes um, dealing with field recordings and some other sort of drone like. Um, so we basically wanted to put an art project together. Um, and he, uh, he actually, you know, we put, we put together about 80% um, of the film. Um, I did all the visuals and we, we talked about it. Um, and he was doing the soundtrack and he actually passed away a few years ago. So we haven't been able to finish the film, I have to basically finish 20% of the, uh, the music of the film. And I'm, I'm, I've, I've figured out a solution for it. And I'm, you know, I, it took a long time for me to sort of realize what the solution was, because it has to mix in um, with what Matt had already done. And what we're gonna do is actually record some music here in Buffalo uh, with uh, sort of like an experimental gamelan group, noise group here that we're sort of uh, played a few shows 
uh, doing with some really amazing um, musicians who are not Gaumont musicians, but are just great um, uh, sort of like avant-garde uh, uh, musicians, jazz musicians here in Buffalo. So we're going to put together that last 20 minutes. Uh, we actually planned on uh, recording that this spring, um, but then this COVID thing happened. So we, we haven't been able to get together to, to, to record it. Um, so, you know, hopefully that happens soon. Um, yeah, you know, that'd be nice to finish that movie. It's been a long time coming. And then it'd be great to release it to a wider audience because I, I believe that film is actually even in some ways a, a bit better than these films in terms of just like my experience with, um, you know, putting movies together. I, I, I like it quite a bit. So I hope it gets out there sometime. Matt? Yo. I have a couple of questions. Anyway, could you say something about uh, how you chose the title? Which film? Thousand Bells. The Stirring of a Thousand Bells. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I didn't really know how to, um, how to uh, title that, because there, there, there are two different movies that are very different from each other. So that's actually a, a Colin McPhee quote. Um, if you're familiar with Colin McPhee, he's a Canadian. Um, one of my teachers, yes. He's one of your teachers, so yeah. Are you familiar with, the, with that quote of his? No. Okay, so yeah, he, he basically wrote, you, you know, my idea was to like, basically come up with a description of what Gamelon kind of sounds like, um, and then make that the title of the film. But, you know, sort of researching and, and I really liked his description of, of that. So he, he said that Gamelon was, to him, the, like the stirring of a thousand bells. And <laughs> to the Western, you know, if you ever try to play some Gamelon music for somebody who's un unfamiliar with Gamelon music uh, or, or somebody comes to a Gamelon show and you ask them to describe what they'd seen, it's very difficult for people that, are, that aren't really um, familiar with like how Gamelon works to describe it. Like, oh yeah, it's a bunch of bells. Uh, it sounds, you know, people have no idea what the instruments would look like if they've never seen them and only heard a recording, uh, which I find to be pretty fascinating. So, uh, so yeah, that, that's out to Colin McPhee, um, who is actually, if you get, if you, if you, yes, you donate $30 to the New Centaur Arts Preservation Fund, which money goes to uh, Musicians Dollar, you will get a copy of this. And, your, and, and Colin McPhee's name is inside here. <laughs> see your email. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, um, what was my, uh, my other question? There were so many. I, tr I tried to see how much time you, you spent viewing the musicians themselves. Sometimes it was less than a minute. And then we would have five minutes of carnival. So to me, it's, it was like a carnival movie with saccate music. <laughs> I'm glad that you brought out the sacred aspects of the Sakatan celebration. And then, uh, you know, the carnival aspect obviously is much younger, mm -hmm. about 300 years old. <laughs> so at some point, you know, those things got added. So you've got things that are happening that are very religious. And we didn't see much of that. We saw the, the Rice Mountain for about a half a minute. But anyway, those are my comments. Yeah, so I, um, I filmed, uh, I, I did the whole filming for the whole thing over the course of two, of two different consecutive Sakatans. So mm -hmm. the, first, the first year I went, I just filmed the, um, the night market and I filmed the musicians. And I was actually out of town. I was out of solo when they did the Gunungan celebration the first year I was there. So I, I didn't get a chance to, to film it. Um, so the second year came around and I went back and I, I did some other shots of some other carnival aspects that I, that I wanted to include that I didn't get the first year. And then I also got to go to the Gunungan um, the second year. And yeah, I wanted to get a little bit closer. I thought I, I had a pretty good vantage point for, you know, the procession in, but you don't get to really see what's happening too well, a little bit closer to the mosque. In the in the movie because I was I was actually quite far away and I didn't have a zoom lens on my camera unfortunately um, and yeah there there the juxtaposition of the the sort of the more 
old and ancient, you could say, um, religious, um, you know, things that have gone and, and endured for a long time with, you know, probably some, some amount of change, but probably also has remained the same for a long time. And just supposing that with the, uh, the new sort of uh, Pasar Malam night market is, is I think it's all part of it. You know, I wanted to add them both because a lot of times when you go there and if you're wandering around at night, you might go and see Sakatan for a little bit and then you leave and then you go to the night market and you go back and forth a bit. So it's, it's for me, that was a big part of the experience was sort of both. And I wanted to, to sort of show, uh, you know, the musicians, I think there's some stretches in there where we just see musicians for a while as well. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a little bit more, you know, I had so much footage from the night market. I just, I, and I wanted to show everything. Cause like I said, like, this is like a movie that's also my memories, you know, of, of this place. And I wanted to put all of my memories in this package so I, I wouldn't have to forget them, you know, or if I forgot them, I, I could just watch the movie again and remember all these uh, interesting things. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I, um, may I have a couple of comments and a question. Um, hey, a hey, lot of what I've been thinking hey, about. Hey, yeah. Mark. Hi. Hey. Hi. <laughs> I'm Matt. Yes. <laughs> I guess I haven't entered. We haven't been, we haven't yeah. actually met. <laughs> so <Sure>. hello. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I found the film really uh, raises a lot of questions for me, and many of which have already been raised by others. And um, so one one question is, and I guess you just answered one one of the questions, which is why so many cuts and why so many super in, impositions? Um, because there is a way of filming that would bring you experience near um, that would be actually the opposite of that, no cuts where you simply have a camera and you're following a person around and you get a sense of the geography, you get a sense of what, you know, what it's like to walk from one end to the other. Um, the exact opposite of, of, with, with maybe the same uh, goal in mind, right? Of, of giving the impression of being there. Um, um, so that was, but you, you sort of answered in your, when you said that you were trying to cram everything in. <laughs> Yeah, but, there's, there's the, that's part of the answer to that question. And, and the other one is sort of like, um, I wanted to put the viewer in the mindset of somebody who was relatively confused um, and, and didn't understand what they were looking at. And, and probably while they are sitting and watching Sakatan, their, their mind is actually wandering to what they had just experienced in the Pasar Malam and sort of like trying to review and, you know, when, when you, I don't know, when I was in Indonesia, my experience was there's so many new, uh, there's so many new inputs, you know, there, there are so many things that I, that I didn't know what they were and my brain was trying to process what I was seeing that I would get confused very often. And I would, I would, I would have to sort of, um, you know, replay things, you know, and it's sort of, uh, you know, in my experience, I, 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 there's a, a slight euphoric elements of confusion, you know, when, when you don't really understand what you're seeing, but you, you can feel it emotionally. So um, for me, I sort of wanted to try to try to capture that feeling that I had when I was there. And, and sort of that is, you know, all these cuts um, in, in sort of quick succession. I tried to put some longer sections. I think there's, there is one section in there where um, walk, basically just walking down one of the uh, corridors of, of sort of tense um, and sort of following people and, and interacting with some of the people um, that, that are, that are around me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so here's just a, a really small question. The, the, in the very beginning, there's a kind of drone like Vuvuzela kind of sound. And I'm just wondering that was, that was not from Sakatan, right? That was something else. <laughs> well, it's, or, Something that you will hear before the night market starts, because what it is, it's the uh, call to prayer, actually. So that is the, uh, yeah. you call it a zan or something. There's a few different uh, words for it. Um, and it happens five, day, five uh, times a day. Um, and it's broadcast from hundreds, uh, if not thousands of mosques um, in Solo at the same exact time. 
and if you're not familiar with it, basically you have either a recording or you have somebody at the mosque who's actually singing these, uh, these, these short phrases um, through a megaphone that blasts out. And so what happens is you have all these mosques that are, that are basically playing, uh, doing the same thing at the same time, and it creates this amazing uh, sort of cacophony of, of, of noise. And, one of the, and, and also in the very beginning of the movie, so there's sort of like a, there's like a sunset, or actually, that's actually a sunrise uh, shot is what I took um, mm -hmm. in the morning with the with Merapi in the background. And one of the experiences I had when I first moved to Indonesia, like maybe within my first three weeks there, you know, you're, you're, you sort of get uh, adapted to life, you know, subconsciously, uh, you know, even though you, you know that these things are happening five times a day, um, you're not necessarily prepared to hear uh, this large, loud noise, you know, when you're not used to getting up very early. A lot of people in Indonesia are going to get up before the first call to prayer. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, being a Westerner, I might maybe uh, my, the time that I get up is a little later. So I remember I was woken up by this, um, all this noise, uh, you know, mm -hmm. or well, not, I don't want to call it noise, but all, all this, all this sound. And uh, so uh, the place where I was renting had sort of this like, little second story balcony, which is pretty lucky. Not a lot of places had a little second story balcony where I could hang my laundry. So I heard all this crazy noise and I was just sort of like in this, I was very hot, you know, and I think I was a little bit sick. I had some illness or something. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't really have a very, my, my mind was sort of still wrapping itself around all these things that were new. So, you know, sort of in like a delirious state, I, I wandered up the stairs and I opened the door and like, it was like this insane, you know, like dark red sunrise. And then all this incredible noise. And it was just like, I, that was when I realized I was like, wow, this, this is not uh, the United States. This is a different place. Mm -hmm. Things here are different beyond, you know, what anybody can really understand, you know, unless you live somewhere for a long time, I don't think you'll, you can really understand how different uh, other cultures are. And, and it's, it's really amazing to recognize difference. Um, and I think uh, accept difference, you know, and, and appreciate it. So I was like, at that point, I was like, all right, I, I, I dedicated myself to uh, diving in, you know, to uh, this different world that was around me at, at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think the passage I was referring to was the Adzan. I mean, the, there were, there were, so there were no, there was no like experimental electronic music or anything like that that you used in the, there were parts of it that, so everything, all of the sound was stuff that you had recorded. There. Okay, yep, yeah, yeah, so, Everything that wasn't gamelan was a field recording, so uh, there there wasn't uh, there there wasn't any manipulation really of uh, you know maybe I I amplified some of the the you know the sounds so I could hear everything I wanted to hear with some compression, um, but all the sounds that were there were re recordings mm -hmm. from the night market, and I think some things I looped I, I looped some recordings. Um, but there was, yeah, everything was a, everything was a field recording. Um, okay. yeah, I would just like to say thank you for everybody for coming. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it and I hope y'all check out the next movie whenever it comes out. And if you want to get a copy of the movie and a t-shirt from Nusantara Arts, check out our website, donate at least $30 to preservation excuse me, the preservation fund. Um, and we will send those out to you. And, and please come back for Professor Sumar Sum's talk on Sunday. I can't wait to hear more about this and more about Gamelan history. Um, very, very excited about it. If you don't know Professor Sumar Sum, he's one of the eminent scholars in Gamelan theory and history. And actually, uh, Pa L back there as well is, is another eminent scholar in uh in gamelan composition and in, in, in performance uh so i can't wait and we will see everybody on sunday thanks for coming <laughs>